It's time now for World Watchers International with Mae Brussel, who for over 17 years has investigated and exposed political conspiracies worldwide. World Watchers International originates at KLRB Carmel, California. Here's Mae. Good evening. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. It's tape 485, March 22nd, 1981. I'm going to put aside for a few weeks the current stories on the Wells Fargo Bank in California and the Nugent Hand Bank in Australia, the CIA with the missing money, and uh, go to a subject of the book Best Evidence that David Lifton wrote. I get calls about that and letters about that, and the book is being discussed in various newsletters among the assassination researchers, so I thought I should spend this week, maybe next week also, but possibly tie it up this week as much as I want to say about um, the book. It is a 700-page book. And I may do this as part one and continue it or try to wind it up this evening. But uh, I have a reason to discuss it at length because it is a book on the Kennedy assassination, and that is the research that I began 17 years ago. That is why I began, began my research when John Kennedy was murdered. I've known David Lifton personally for 15 years. I met him at the time that I was helping David Welsh uh, write the Ramparts article, the first uh, public expose of the Warren Commission and the Kennedy murder. That's the time that I met Penn Jones Jr. living down in Texas, and various researchers around the country became familiar with each other after the Ramparts article came out. Lifton uh, was very exact. He was a scientist. He was always questioning information I had and trying to keep separated rumor or uh, disinformation from what was actually uh, information that could be documented and proven. And he seemed, with his scientific background, to be very exact. And for that reason, I was looking forward to his book very much. He moved to New York a couple of years ago. He was working in California until then. And we had contact back and forth. And at the time, uh, I last talked to him about the book he was doing. I was under the impression it had to do with the military involvement of the motorcade uh, when John Kennedy was murdered, the Dallas trap that was set for John Kennedy, the military officials that were in the car, and the way the Army was used the day the President of the United States was murdered. I was always under the impression this would be the subject of his book. Uh, David provided a lot of documents for me. He was the only researcher I knew that went to Washington before the Freedom of Information Act and got me documents that I've sold articles uh, about using that and some of the most important work I've had to support the book that I'm writing on Lee Harvey Oswald and the Kennedy assassination that 17-year project, which is completely researched now and ready to be written. If I set the time aside just to write that and I keep up with the current news the way I do. But uh, David Lifton gave me documents that uh, actually hold the book together that I wouldn't have as good a book without them, and he was very generous. And furthermore, he had published in 1966 the document addendum to the Warren Report, and these were very valuable minutes of the Warren Commission uh, before they ever began to hear witnesses in December and January when they were first assembled. And he had an introduction to those minutes, and I felt that he completely comprehended, of course, the subject and devoted a lot of energy to it. I knew that he was studying engineering at UCLA at the time that uh, he was doing all this research. I didn't know at the time that uh, he was a graduate from Cornell, not that that mattered in physics, but that he was working for NASA for the Moon Project, the Apollo Project, and that he worked full-time for North American Aviation in the evening and went to UCLA at night. Uh, when the Torbett document came out with uh, evidence or suggestion or leads to people involved in NASA, such as Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger, and their links to the assassination of John Kennedy and other murders that followed or preceded it. Uh, Lifton, among others, did not want to receive the Torbett document and has stayed far, far away from the NASA equal Nazi connections to the assassination. But I've known him for a long time. I knew of his scientific background. I knew that he was working hard on a book. So naturally, 
I was looking forward to the book, and uh, I was indebted to him for a lot of documents, and he called and uh, mailed me a complimentary copy of Best Evidence. So uh, my first opinion would, of course, would be to eagerly await this book and take out of it what I could as being a very important book with the Ken uh, about the Kennedy assassination. Now, uh, the fact that uh, a book is critical of the Warren Commission doesn't necessarily mean it is a good book, and the fact that he's compiled 700 pages of all kinds of information and um, documents from the archives and from interviews, personal interviews with people, witnesses uh, pertaining to the assassination, specifically the autopsy of John Kennedy. He did a lot of work, but the fact that he met a lot of people uh, doesn't mean it is a good book either. In fact, I believe that this book could go into the book of records as being one of the largest books of documentation that proves nothing because best evidence is very deficient in uh, supporting what he alleges took place, and it's so out of character for David Lifton that it's hard to believe it's the same David Lifton I knew uh, that could compile such a miserable book. Now, he makes allegations in this book that uh, are important, and it's interesting the way that uh, Time magazine gave two pages to the review. The Book of the Month Club bought the book, Macmillan, uh, generally linked to British intelligence, published it, and he's doing a lot of tours, and it immediately became a bestseller because it was bought by the Book of the Month Club, assuring so many sales from the start. The only other researcher that got such notoriety was Mark Lane with his rush to judgment, and as Penn Jones wrote in Forgive My Grief, um, Hold Reinhardt, the publishers of Mark Lane's book, Rush to Judgment, uh, were the owners or controlling stockholders were the merchants and family in Texas who had been linked through various connections to Richard Nixon and the assassination of John Kennedy in the Southwest, the merchants and family, H.L. Hunts, and so forth. So that the very first book that got the most common attention was put out by the Merchantsons, and now Macmillan was catapulting David Lifton to seem to replace Mark Lane's position as the researcher with the book and yet allowing him to tour, giving less information actually in the 700 pages than Mark Lane gave in Rush to Judgment. Uh, if I had to compare the two books, I would say Rush to Judgment was a much superior book. I was asked to do a review of best evidence. I mentioned this before on one of the broadcasts, a national magazine, and they gave me three areas they wanted me to cover in this book review. Uh, how does it add to the general information of the assassination researchers? Does he support his allegations? And can we learn from it? And would it make any difference if we took his information? What difference would it make if it were true or false? And those were the things they wanted me to cover. I spent one entire week just reading the 700 pages, another week outlining and cross-filing the information and then a week writing it. So I spent almost a month just with this book, consuming it and studying it and making many, many notes and copying it. And uh, I wrote what I thought was a good review, and I spoke to the publishers of the magazine, and they paid me the full fee, which was very generous. It paid for those three weeks, the time involved. But they told me they couldn't print it because it wasn't favorable to David Lifton. Uh, the, the review was a good analytical review for people who want to study the assassination literature or the facts, but that 70, this is what I was told, that 70 or 80 percent of the country wouldn't understand, and therefore they should be told it was a good book. Uh, I, it was a firm contract when I wrote the uh, report, because I wouldn't spend three weeks on something without being sure a full fee, not a kill fee. So I got my money back, and I can use my review in any way that I want for newsletters or radio talk shows, but they would not print it unless it was favorable. And if an expert on the subject criticized it, uh, that would stop the uh, sale of the book, I suppose. So the main thing is that the book will be sold, and there will no, be no criticism of it, probably by a major magazine, and very few people will have the patience to tackle the book. Now, best evidence, 
uh, has some allegations. I'll briefly list some of them for you that David Lifton makes. And as I say, I've known Lifton so long that it's really hard to believe that uh, he would make them without supporting them, but that is what happens in best evidence. He says that the corpse of President Kennedy was surgically altered, that before the autopsy at Bethesda Hospital, the official autopsy, and he has the time schedule, that there was a pre-autopsy or a surgical procedure to alter the corpse of John Kennedy. Secondly, the medical forgery was done specifically to conceal and rearrange the wounds other than the direction from which they came. That If they came from the front, they had to be rearranged on the body of John Kennedy's corpse before the autopsy began in order to say that they came from the direction where Lee Harvey Oswald was behind the president. He claims the bullet wounds on the back and neck and the scalp injuries were purposely rearranged by doctors, these were his words, for the purpose of the pre-autopsy surgery was exactly disguise and deception. There was no other reason except disguise and deception. The Secret Service agents were responsible for the corpse. He, this is what he says, that he attributes the mistakes in uh, switching bodies and locating them and having double autopsies and empty coffins is blamed on the Secret Service. There is a chain, a break in the chain of possession of the John Kennedy body from a bronze coffin into a wood coffin and from a white sheets covered naked body with white sheets to plastic body bag and then back under the sheets. He claims that the military guards responsible for watching John Kennedy when he, the body arrived at, at Andrews Air Force Base were lost and they followed the wrong coffin and had to go back, and the coffin was already at Bethesda. He says Pentagon, top officials, the Army, and Navy personnel, someone in the military, was covering up who killed John Kennedy by altering the body and thus making it look like Lee Harvey Oswald did it. Therefore, they were covering for a real assassin. He never mentions who it would be, but uh, allegedly somebody over at the grassy knoll fence, and for this the top brass would be covering or putting themselves on the line to cover for the real assassin. The motive for the surgical altering was to misdirect further inquiries and get the investigators off in the wrong direction. The doctors were participating in this but not identified. Uh, they were military, but he doesn't know who that the wounds in JFK had to be consistent with the location of Lee Harvey Oswald, which they knew immediately was behind. He was behind the president in the Texas School Book Depository. He alleges that Warren Commission members and their staff were simply diverted in their conclusions and caused such a large uh, uh, collection of literature critical of their work simply because they were diverted by the wounds on Kennedy's body at the time they received it for autopsy. He claims that Commander James Humes, Colonel Pierre Fink, and Dr. J. Thornton Boswell, Chief of Pathology at Bethesda, Maryland, were deceived that they received a body that had been altered when they began their first autopsy. The Chief Justice Earl Warren didn't lie. Um, he didn't deceive the people in the United States with the Warren report that the basis upon which the Warren report was written was simply an error because the body had been altered before the, the original or what was supposed to be the original autopsy, that military commands of silence came down from officers to enlisted men not to talk about what they saw in the surgical rooms at the time of autopsy, and that Oswald, the patsy, was selected as the patsy when they heard that he was behind the president and this necessitated the quick rearrangement of those locations of wounds and uh, removing the brains of the president to not show the direction of the bullets or the kinds of bullets and that the doctors had to be very busy switching coffins and body bags under sheets and cutting into the president's head or possibly sitting him up and shooting holes in his back and there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of possibilities to support uh, these kinds of allegations.
But the problem is that there's so many and they're so contradictory and hardly any of them make sense at all. Now, what's wrong with David Lifton's thesis that uh, there was a pre-autopsy that took place before the original autopsy and that the original, what the autopsy that the Warren Commission used was simply wrong and that all of them, the staff, were innocently misled because a group of people had sewn the head of the president together or cut the flesh or shot into it to confuse them when they uh, received that body on the table and took the sheet off the body and began their autopsy they didn't know and had been altered. First of all, uh, the major flaw with the book is that he has a detailed series of diagrams of where it would have taken place and the time schedules of the leaving of Kennedy's uh, airplane, his coffin, uh, from Dallas on the airplane. And he charts all of this out and doesn't leave any time for uh, identifying the location of where this would happen. He never says or hints he has many possibilities how it could have happened on Air Force One or maybe underneath when the empty coffin, the bronze coffin on Air Force One would be empty and Jacqueline uh, Kennedy was leaning over an empty coffin or crying and nobody knew it wasn't there. He doesn't explain how this would happen at Parkland Hospital. They had a one-hour stay before the body got on the airplane, how this could possibly happen. He doesn't say whether it was on Air Force One or whether it was en route to uh, Bethesda Hospital, they passed Walter Reed Hospital, at, or did it happen in the surgery room at Bethesda in one room before the room was emptied out and the official autopsy began in the other room. He has a chart, a diagram on page 628 of a hearse arriving at 645, and then he has at 655 Jacqueline Kennedy arriving with the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, and allegedly they were already working on the body that arrived before she arrived with one coffin. Then they have a request to clear the room. Uh, they were going to take x-rays and photos of the body, and then they were supposed to put the body back into a casket in the same room at Bethesda Hospital and then begin the other autopsy. But he isn't sure it happened that way, and it, when it comes to push and shove, he's still vague in these 700 pages where it happened or how it happened or who would have seen it. So he never identifies whether it was Air Force One or Walter Reed, and, in fact, he has a map of the route from uh, Andrews Air Force Base to Walter Reed Hospital to Bethesda. Uh, Walter Reed was the Army Hospital. And he shows you a map of Washington, D.C. on page 682. Andrews Air Force Base going down Pennsylvania Avenue passes Walter Reed. Well, that whole thing took about 20 minutes, which would be hard to take a bloody corpse, open it up, uh, switch it around, do anything to the body, and then deliver it to Bethesda. The time schedules are off, and the David Lifton I knew a few years ago, not many years ago, would never have published a map such as page 682 and even used it for evidence or conversation. He would have laughed at such a simplistic conclusion that because you can pass Walter Reed to get to Beth Esda, there's a possibility that it went to Beth Esda. The arguments about the surgery room at uh, Bethesda or using a Walter Reed to change the body or Air Force One is so vague that it is absolutely inconclusive what in the world he's trying to say where all this altering took place. Uh, the next point, he tried to uh, say that doctors surgically changed this body, and he's very sure about this, but he won't identify any of the doctors. Uh, the identification is missing and all suspected medical staff are cleared. He wrote, It is my belief that none of the three autopsy surgeons were in a plot to alter the body, and yet he prints a chart of the two possible autopsies, and in the one room, the early one, he has Commander Humes, and he has him at the second autopsy, and he has Mr. Boswell at the first and second autopsy, and he has Captain Stover, Dr. Stover, at the first and second autopsy, and he goes the bother of charting out who would have been in the first um, rearrangement of the flesh and who was at the second. And then he writes in the book, 
verbatim that none of the doctors were involved. Uh, on page 698, he says he sincerely believes that um, none of them, none of these doctors, would alter the body or that they would knowingly be involved in illegal activity. Uh, another point which is terribly dangerous is that after he clears all the doctors that he's mentioned as having any part in it, he has what I call the Nuremberg Clause, and he writes, it is inter entirely possible that any number of people thought they were acting honorably and in the line of duty in not disclosing that the body was altered. So he says the body was, the fact remains, Kennedy's body was altered. It did not make an uninterrupted journey from Dallas to Bethesda, and this should be the logical starting point for any future investigation. And that's on page 698, and yet for 698 pages, he absolutely can't tell you when it was altered or who altered it or more important, why they would bother to alter it. And when he does mention people, he excludes them, and then he gives them that famous, as I say, the Nuremberg Clause. It was in the line of duty. He refers all the time uh, to the Secret Service, that if there was hanky-panky taking place, the Secret Service would be the agency responsible for the body. The Dallas Police Department would be responsible. The FBI would be responsible Certainly, when it arrived at Andrews Air Force Base and all the military uh, people, one from the Air Force, one from the Marines, and one from the Navy, and one from the Army guarding the body, plus the FBI, and there were CIA people in the autopsy room, there were Defense Intelligence Agency people, there were people from the Defense Industry Security Command, the National Security Agency, uh, they were all there, and Lifton, uh, has to point to the Secret Service as having the responsibility. That's interesting because he had to work for DISC, Defense Industry Security Command, to work at, at uh, for the Apollo program and the NASA program that he worked at, the space program for North American Aviation. He had to belong to the defense agencies and uh, to get into the grounds and have that security. So it's interesting that he eliminates all the Defense Department and the Pentagon from any hanky-panky and tries to blame the Secret Service. What else was wrong with the necessity to alter this body of John Kennedy? Uh, I don't believe that history has to go so far as to take needles and thread and throw, put the skull together or sew it together or shoot holes into Kennedy's body or stick your finger in through the finger length where the bullet didn't go through and get it through to the throat. I don't believe that those doctors had to alter Kennedy's body at all, even though they knew that the bullets came from behind because Oswald had been arrested by the time they started their autopsy, and they were told that he shot the, the bullets from behind the president. It didn't matter what the Dallas doctor saw, Parkland Hospital entry wounds into John Kennedy's throat, or that they didn't believe that those back wounds did the injuries into Governor Connolly in the same car. All it takes to change history is a fountain pen or a razor blade or a typewriter. At the time that Watergate came down, E. Howard Hunt was paid $100 a day in the White House rewriting State Department documents to say that John Kennedy ordered the murder of D.M. You take secret classified documents and you simply rewrite them. You don't have to have a photograph of John Kennedy in Southeast Asia or uh, doing anything to order the death of DM. All you have to do is a get a good author. At the time of Watergate, Patrick Gray took important documents home and burned them and threw them in the river, that famous deep sixing, destroying important papers. And at the time of the Kennedy assassination, Commander Humes wrote an autopsy report. The FBI wrote a report that day saying a bullet went in John Kennedy's back and it went finger length and didn't go through his body. And it suggested, of course, then there had to be other bullets or bullets coming from another direction that went into John Connolly. But Dr. Hume took his papers home and he testified before the Warren Commission. He burned them in his fireplace. Two days later, he came up with another report. Dr. Hume was told 
that Lee Harvey Oswald stood behind John Kennedy. He called the doctors in Dallas and said, you didn't see entry holes in John Kennedy's throat or you didn't see his back. They said, well, we didn't turn him over. They simply arranged by telephone and by burning what he wrote the first time and wrote what was consistent with the conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald shot John Kennedy. There's no way that he has to stand there and sew up the flesh and blood and take a chance that people are going to know about it. This was a crime of murdering the President of the United States. Why in the world would Commander Humes at the Navy Hospital take a risk or anybody else of altering a corpse just for the sake of protecting an assassin at the Grassy Knoll? You call in Mr. Winokur, the chief historian from the uh, Pentagon, who David Lifton knew through his own book, Born in Germany, uh, he was called to write the Warren Report, and he just simply wrote the conclusions that didn't have to be based upon any of the witness testimony or evidence in the 26 volumes at all. They weren't asked to make the report consistent with the evidence. What was so gross about the Warren Report was that it was inconsistent with the evidence. So, therefore, I don't think that this idea that they had to twist coffins around or slip them from one to the other. I mean, rigor mortis had set in, and you had this gaping head wound, and the President of the United States and the press everywhere and people watching. I don't think they would even be bothered with that sleight of hand. All he did was write down what he saw, burn it, and two days later wrote what they wanted him to say, and that's all Commander Humes had to do. Furthermore, another weakness, I think, in the book is that if there were a plot, to kill John Kennedy and set Lee Harvey Oswald up as a patsy, which he claims was part of the plan, then this conspiracy would necessarily have to kill Lee Harvey Oswald because um, he could prove that he didn't kill Kennedy, that he was in the lunchroom on the second floor, that he didn't own a rifle, that no rifle from Kleins came to his P.O. box. It would be necessary if you had a conspiracy to kill the President of the United States to kill his patsy and that happened two days later. That had to be part of the plot. And many researchers think Lee Harvey Oswald was supposed to be killed in the theater the same day. Well, if you have the president dead and the only lone suspect dead, why would the people at Bethesda think there was even going to be a trial? Why would they bother? Uh, they were either part of a big conspiracy or they weren't. And if the conspiracy is to kill Oswald, then simply do your autopsy on Kennedy, embalm him, bury him, and the chances are he would never, ever be exhumed, and he never will be. So why go to all the trashy conception, you know, the idea of racing around and switching coffins and body bags and double autopsies with the chance that blood is spilling around or people or seeing will blackmail you? Another weakness of Lifton's book, one of the strongest weaknesses, is that he thought that he had this great insight, this super ego, that he had solved the real story of who killed Kennedy. And it was with great delight that he could publish and tell you that Earl Warren and John J. McCloy, former chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and Alan Dulles, former director of the CIA, and Richard Russell, the liaison of the Senate to the CIA, all these old spy dogs from way back, uh, they... Uh, were on the Warren Commission, and they signed the Warren Report. And the Warren Report has been challenged from the day it was published in 1964. And Lifton sincerely, or maybe not sincerely, or make he, maybe he'll make a buck out of this, he certainly will, uh, believes that these people were honorable people who were misled because they wrote their entire report on the fact that there was an honest autopsy and didn't know that the body was exhumed, uh, not exhumed, was examined and altered surgically before they had a chance to get their autopsy report. Now, this is about the biggest piece of hogwash that's come down the turnpike of any of the 250 books on the Kennedy assassination. The, if you read the Warren Report and you read the 26 volumes of commission uh, hearings, the evidence, witness, testimony, evidence, the whole report was corrupt from the word go. They didn't make one mistake based on an autopsy report. That was a den of thieves 
going way back, and Lifton knew it. He published the minutes of the meetings where they ordered the cremation of the corpse of Oswald before Jack Ruby's trial. He knew they were corrupt. So something happened between Los Angeles and Macmillan publishers that caused David Lifton to make a 180-degree angle to get a renowned publisher, but to come out with a book that is just filled with junk. This is the end of the first 30 minutes. When we come back in one minute, I'll do some more on David Lifton's new book, Best Evidence on the Kennedy Assassination. This concludes the first half of World Watchers International with Mae Russell. We will return with the second half after a brief pause. Okay, this is Mae Russell, and I'm spending the entire hour this evening on a book review called, uh, the book is called Best Evidence by David Lifton, published by Macmillan, came out just December of this year, January 1980. It came out the first, the end of the last year, just before the first of the year. Uh, as I said in the beginning, for those of you that might have missed it, I've known David 15 years. He's a scientist. He was always very exact. He had a lot of information. He even has a computer to put his work together. And something very different happened to David Lifton between the time that he got out his first book, The Document Addendum to the Warren Report, uh, fully aware of the hanky-panky, the conniving, the traitorous Warren Commission, uh, as against the man now who has the bestseller with Macmillan and has taken a turnabout, complete turnabout, uh, about the Kennedy assassination and has come up with a book 700 pages of total confusion. Uh, if any of you who do research on the Kennedy assassination read this book and want to discuss it with me, I would be glad to do it. I would like to know, after you read it, what you learned from it and what you believe about it. And you might play this tape back, those of you who have the tape and those of you who are reading the book. What is there about the book that you like? And what can you believe and how does it contribute to the wealth of assassination material so far. I was asked those questions, as I said, and I had to come up with the conclusion that it contributed absolutely nothing. It was a lot of disinformation mixed with information that had no value. Uh, I do know that Lee Harvey Oswald was a scapegoat. I do know that the Warren Commission wrote all shots came from behind John Kennedy. There's evidence that they came from the front, from the grassy knoll. There are photographs of suspects known as the tram pictures of them being taken away. There were puffs of smoke and evidence that a gun was fired at the grassy knoll. And there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that a gunman, a lone gunman from the book depository, was not the person that shot President John Kennedy, that there was a crossfire and one area of shots came from the grassy knoll, and the other possibly with silencers from atop the book depository, the fifth floor or the roof, or over at the Dow Tech's building. He doesn't address himself to any of those questions at all. He simply sticks with the autopsy report, and he has a burning desire in this book. Uh, it's a compulsion, first of all, to work with Wellesley Liebler. Liebler, and I'll do more about him in a few minutes, was on the staff, legal staff, of the Warren Commission. And he was a dangerous man. He was a man I particularly knew from my research because I was studying the Oswald conspiracy, the links of Lee Harvey Oswald to the white Russian community, to the Galen agents. Uh, that man was the head of Hitler's Eastern Division of um, the Nazi organization, Reinhard Galen. And he brought people into the Dallas-Fort Worth area with Alan Dulles of the CIA, who were friends and worked with Lee and Marina Oswald. Now, in that area, Wellesley Liebler, Liebler was the counsel who took the testimony of Samuel Ballin. Uh, Liebler alone, with no member of the commission present, took the testimony of George Bowie, one of the most important witnesses before the uh, committee. Liebler uh, worked alone with Max Clark and did not call his wife Galley Clark. Uh, they were two of the most important keys to the conspiracy to killing John Kennedy. They didn't call Paul Dimitri to testify. 
he interviewed and assisted with the testimony of Declan Ford and Catherine Ford, two of the Galen agents' important witnesses uh, in the spy espionage part of Lee and Marina Oswald and their Russian connections to Na and Navy intelligence. He took the testimony of Paul Gregory, with nobody present from the Warren Commission, and Peter Paul Gregory, his son, Earl Warren and Gerald Ford were present, and two other people. He took the testimony of Elena Hall and John Hall, and a very important witness, Frank Kristenick. He took his testimony with Albert Jenner. Kristenick worked for Bell Helicopter, and he was the first person to make the connection of Lee Harvey Oswald to the assassination and was calling the authorities. Uh, he took his testimony and that of Anna Miller. Anna Miller's name was in Marina Oswald's book, notebook in the Soviet Union before she ever came to the United States, and she was the woman in the Dallas-Fort Worth area who defended her with other czarist Russians, such as Galley Clark, who belonged to the Sherbatov family, and the uh, royal, uh, the entourage of the white Russian community in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that George Bowie brought in as part of the Greek Orthodox Church, the Solidaris, the CIA organization, the Tolstoy, Foundation, all CIA foundations, and Liebler uh, took part of the testimony of Michael Payne, a very important person who worked at Bell Helicopter for Walter Dornberger, the Nazi war criminal who came over with NASA, the same agency that was hiring or hired David Lifton at the time that he was doing his research. So Liebler was a dangerous person, and he wasn't interested in the autopsy of John Kennedy. That wasn't his area. That was Arlen Specter's area, and he's now a senator from Philadelphia. So Lifton, uh, when the Liebler came out to UCLA to teach law, to get his law students to uh, be brainwashed to support the Warren Commission, um, David Lifton attached himself to Liebler. And I've never known such an emotional bond. I knew he had it, and he would refer to Liebler all of the time, and we would talk. And I've never known such an emotional bond between two people. And in this book, it comes out over and over again. Uh, the index pages of Liebler in two sections of the index hardly cover. His name is used maybe 55 times on two pages. And it reminds me of David Lifton, Lifton's obsession with Liebler. Uh, the relationship of Liebler to David Lifton is very much like Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss. Meyer Zelig wrote the book Friendship and Fratricide, and he tried to put a homosexual link of, of Whitaker Chambers to Alger Hiss, even though both men were married and had children and families, that it was an emotional tie. And the, flaw, the fault with that book that Zelig wrote, he was a psychiatrist, was that he missed the entire espionage part, the part of Whitaker Chambers working for Henry Luce in Time magazine, the same uh, Henry Luce that had the Abraham Zabruder films that rearranged the frames and had them locked up of the Kennedy assassination. And Whitaker Chambers had contacts with Germans, with a man from Russia called the Chinaman. It was also the name of George de Morinchild. They used to call him the Chinaman. It could have been and might be the same man. Uh, Alger Hiss was a person exposing in 1933 the rearming of Germany. He brought the book The Merchants of Death to the Nye Committee in Congress, and he was putting the DuPonts and Mellons on the carpet for arming Germany and Adolf Hitler in the 30s. Uh, Meyer Zellick missed the espionage relationship of Whitaker Chambers to later bringing down Alger Hiss. And the, in the entire relationship of um, David Lifton to Liebler, it was like a cat and mouse pawning, playing, fighting. And this book is consumed with references to Wesley Liebler. And if you don't know Lifton and don't know the circumstances, you'd think for the first 200 pages that he's addressing his desperation to prove a point simply to make Liebler, who was on the Warren Commission staff, sit back and say, yes, David, you've cracked the shell of the Kennedy conspiracy. He thinks, because he found an FBI report by uh, two agents um, in 1966, that he really found the clue of the surgical altering of the president's head. He calls that the Rosetta Stone of the conspiracy research. Uh, I have a very close friend who called it Lifton's pet rock, and I used that in the review, and I think it's very good. He gets obsessed 
with trying to make Liebler acknowledge that he has found more than the commission. And he harangues away at Liebler page after page until finally Liebler goes back east and sees John J. McCloy of the CIA and the Warren Commission and Gerald Ford and the upper bonds, and he comes home cold turkey and cuts Lifton off and just severs the contact with him, and then Lifton's out on his own. So after a few couple hundred pages in the book, he is weaned from the Liebler obsession and then gets on to a lot of information of witnesses that I think they supplied to him to misdirect him or lead him in the wrong direction. Something happened funny to Lifton, and I think a lot of it was his pursuit of Liebler and then people coming forward and giving lift and disinformation and confusing information and names of people in the military who were at the autopsy that the Warren Commission wouldn't use, the House Select Committee on assassinations wouldn't use, but they would give it to Lifton and give it to a publisher for the purpose that they could say, look, we've had too many books on the assassination or this one uh, sold, but even if it's sold, you won't know any more after you plunk down your 1695. It's like the game, uh, pin the tail on the donkey. You have the ass at one end that I refer to often, and you hold the tail in your hand, and somebody blindfolds you. And if somebody has good intentions and spins you around, even blindfolded, you may make a contact. But if they don't want you to get there, they can head you all together in a different direction, and that's where you're going to go. And something happened to Lifton between Los Angeles and New York and Macmillan that really isn't consistent, as I said, with the Lifton that I knew that was working in Los Angeles. Now, in addition to his psychological attachment to Liebler, he had a, another purpose. He had a three-part uh, purpose in this book that comes out loud and clear. One, the emotional desire to prove to Liebler that he, too, could figure out what happened. Uh, secondly, was a, a desire and necessity to put down the... Uh, researchers, he refers to them as the critics, that the critics were wrong here, the critics were wrong there, the critics were misdirected, the critics didn't know about the altering of the body, the critics didn't know that uh, when the autopsy report was given that the Warren Commission was right, that Earl Warren was right, that nobody lied. He says it would have been easier for me to accept they lied than that ghoulish idea that they rearranged the body. Well, this is just hogwash, and if you're analytical, and if you're honest, and if you read the book honestly, you will see that it is a miserable book in terms of truth or how the critics were misdirected. They weren't, and we weren't, misdirected at all. Lifton has sold out. In his book, he says, Among my peers in 1966, there was a radical notion the first generation of Warren Report critics, that's me, starting day one, not only believed the Warren Report was wrong, but that the commission's legal staff had perpetuated a deliberate cover-up. What I saw in Wellesley Liebler's class at UCLA made me understand that no cover-up was necessary. And then the logic is that he attends a class at UCLA, a series where Liebler is teaching these students about who killed John Kennedy, and the students are following it hook, line, and sinker, and therefore uh, something is wrong in the rational process of coming to these conclusions that there was no hanky-panky and that Liebler is telling it and the students are following up. What he doesn't say is that every lawyer from the Warren Commission, including Liebler, was from the Central intelligence agency, and what he doesn't say is that Liebler takes the evidence to support the questions he's giving them uh, to make the hypothesis appear true, and therefore the students uh, come to the same conclusions he did. He didn't teach the class by opening up the 26 volumes and the critical work of Joe Joston, who wrote Oswald, Assassin, or Fall Guy, or Paris Flamone's Kennedy Conspiracy, or Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment, or Savage's Who Killed Kennedy, Thomas Buchanan's Who Killed Kennedy, and Savage's book on the Kennedy Conspiracy. The early researchers that were hitting it right on the head and making major contributions, uh, they said the Warren Report was wrong, and it was. 
the legal staff had perpetuated a deliberate cover-up. This can be proven. And Lifton has this need to protect the Warren Commission staff and the Warren Commission. And he has the need for the approval of Liebler. And he has the need to believe that the critics were simply misled, that we had uh, a wrong idea about the Kennedy autopsy. And he gets into the childish assumption in this book that one piece of paper, an FBI report by James Siebert and Francis O'Neill, one FBI report written in uh, Epstein's book, Inquest, and also in uh, the Oswald, The Doubles by Popkin, that this report is what misdirected me, them, and caused this a uh, bunch of books, over 250, critical of the Warren Commission. Now, Lifton can't truly believe that this FBI report diverted all of us. I mean, he must know, and as I say, the road from here to there and to making a buck, I don't know how many routes a person has to take, but somewhere, some way along the line, he sold out to everything he knew he actually knew. Now, as I say in this book, he can't locate where or how or when the second autopsy took place. Who did it? He, he denies any person had any responsible doing it. They, we don't have robots doing autopsies yet. I saw 60 Minutes, these mice taking care of a paraplegic, but they're not doing autopsies and writing reports yet. And I furthermore don't believe that, that with all the evidence they had to make Lee Harvey Oswald a patsy, the plants use his name in Chicago, where Kennedy was supposed to be killed the first November, or in Miami, or wherever. The, there were so many Oswald doubles and planted evidence and forged documents. The very last thing you had to do was to alter the corpse of the President of the United States. Now, the, and finally, the title of the book is called Best Evidence. And he writes on page 132 in Law, Best evidence concept impressed on all law students is that when you want to determine a fact, seek a fact, from conflicting data, you must arrange the data according to the hierarchy of reliability. In this case, the conflicting data was the doctors at Parkland versus the doctors at Bethesda Hospital. But in some cases, you don't always get conflicting data. In this case, they had very little data. He says, all data are not equal. Some evidence, physical evidence, is more inherently error-free and hence more reliable than other evidence. The best evidence rules the conclusion. Whatever volume of contrary evidence there may be in lower categories, that's such as witness testimony. Now, the best evidence, he claims, was the autopsy report of President John Kennedy that that was the best evidence to solve the entire crime and to correct all the history books that are wrong up to this point. Now, the autopsy report, as far as I'm concerned, was not and is not the best evidence to the Kennedy assassination. First of all, it can't be the best evidence because Dr. Humes wrote one autopsy report, November 22, 1963, and he burned it two days later in his fireplace, and wrote it. He said he burned it because there was too much blood on it. And because he burned it, that is not acceptable once it was destroyed. If no other evidence was played around with, I could accept his cleaning up his act. But that wasn't the way it worked. So you're left with a group of people trying to find out how many wounds in the corpse, where the wounds were located and uh, on the body, and were they entry or exit wounds. It's simply down to a matter of that. And anything that illustrates where the wounds were on John Kennedy and whether they entered or exited and how many is the way to solve the crime of who killed the President of the United States. Now, x-rays were taken of John Kennedy's body before the autopsy and photographed 65 pictures of the body. Those were the best evidence, because as soon as the autopsy was done, that he said was done twice, the embalmers were in the room. The body was embalmed. It was shipped to the east room of the White House, and the next day it was buried. As soon as they surgically altered the entire body, according to him, they buried it. So why go to all the trouble if the body was going to be on exhibit, if other scientists were to see it? 
that would be the best evidence. But the Warren Commission didn't use the x-rays, and they didn't use the photographs, and therefore they were in error down the line, not because they were misdirected, but because they had evidence they refused to use. They called in an artist to draw a third person where the bullet wounds were on John Kennedy's body, and years later when the House Select Committee on Assassinations was formed, they raised them up a few inches and called in another artist and still didn't let the American people measure with a ruler where the bullet holes were. So the second time around and the first time around, the best evidence is still held back, and these people like Robert Blakey and uh, Gerald Ford and members of the Warren Commission and John J. McCloy, the dead and the live ones are a pack of liars because they still don't use it. Next best evidence was the brains of John Kennedy. They were taken, according to uh, Lifton's book, the brain cavity was empty, the brains were gone, the skull was empty. Another part of the book, the brains were taken on a cart down the hall, a disguised as a newborn child. Another section, they were hit with an axe down the middle and were in the skull cavity. He can't explain where they were, but one thing we know, from the time John Kennedy died until the present day, the brains have never been examined. But the Warren Commission had from December and January until September to examine them for bullet fragments to see if they were identical with Lee Harvey Oswald's bullets and didn't ask for the brains. So they had the x-rays, they had the pictures, they had the brains. They didn't ask for them. The clothing of John Conley was sent to the dry cleaner. The Dallas police didn't have it. The FBI didn't have it. When the commission wanted it, it had been destroyed and dry cleaned. That was evidence that the commission could have used. They could have used the x-rays and the pictures. They could have used the coat of John Kennedy and his shirt, which the Warren Commission didn't use to see if it was consistent with the drawings of where they were dictating to an artist the bullet went. They never asked the owners of Newsweek and Time magazine why they uh, drew a scope or photographed a rifle, allegedly Oswald's, and put the scope out because a man named Mr. Ryder said a scope was attached in November. When they found out the gun came from Kleins with the scope attached, they reprinted pictures with the scope attached. Why do national magazines like Time and Newsweek uh, take a scope out of a picture, put the scope back in? That is evidence. The Abraham Zabruder films that were rearranged, the pieces of the film that were kept out, the, the Warren Commission that published them backwards to make the head go a different direction than where it went, that was evidence the Warren Commission didn't use. They didn't use tape recordings that were, in fact, made. People took notes of the interviews with Lee Harvey Oswald for 48 hours in the Dallas jail. The Dallas police, the FBI, the Secret Service, all must have known where the notes went or who took them because there was reference to these notes, not the tape recording, but written notes, and they were destroyed. And who ordered the car interior of John Kennedy destroyed? The car would it be as good evidence to solve the crime of who killed John Kennedy as John Kennedy's body. As I say, why go to the bother of uh, sewing him up or sneaking brains out or, or shooting extra holes into him, sitting up and doing all of this, when one minute later after you do all that, you're going to embalm him and bury the guy, and the assassin, the alleged assassin, is going to be killed 24 hours later, a little more than 24 hours later. It doesn't make sense. But who orders the car removed to Michigan and the interior destroyed? How many bullets were in the car interior? How many were in the body? I've heard stories about somebody who was friendly with the Secret Service and that there were, bullet, in fact, bullets. Mr. Kellerman of the Secret Service said a flurry of bullets came to us. The Warren Commission could have used the street sign that was removed where bullet fragments could have been into it. Lifton refers to the street sign and with cavalier attitude, oh, that was just removed where there could have been fragments hit by silencers in this crossfire and the lamppost that was removed. Uh, Lee R.B. Oswald's mailbox application that legally would remain two years was taken away and destroyed where the I rifle would have been mailed from Kleins. And it goes on and on. The uh, Richard Sprague, the photographer, the computer expert, uh, has had uh, many uh, lectures and documentation of approximately 25,000 feet a film taken at Dealey Plaza, the Warren Commission didn't use. And there's the famous pictures of those tramps, suspects taken away in the custody of police. 
and a gentleman, Mr. Hicks, putting, picking up shells at Dealey Plaza, and uh, all kinds of evidence that was destroyed right and left and not used. The Warren Commission were not innocent babes. Wellesley Liebler was one of the most dangerous attorneys. He and Albert Jenner of the entire Warren Commission because they were in charge of the conspiracy part, the real conspiracy that links to the Nazi connections and the space agency and the CIA connections. Albert Jenner was an attorney for General Dynamics and for Henry Crown in Chicago with his multinational holdings and General Dynamics. And Max Clark in Dallas, the man who befriended Lee and Marina Oswald with his wife, was chief of security at Convair. So Albert Jenner was interviewing Max Clark and didn't have Galley Clark on the witness stand. So Albert Jenner and Lifton were dangerous people to concealing the conspiracy. And Lifton, working with the space agency, is excusing in his book, and it's very dangerous. He's excusing any doctors of involvement in this trickery while he's saying there was a plot. He's saying it's a deep-level plot, but none of them knew what they were doing. He says if they were doing it, they were doing it in a line of duty. He won't lo locate where they did it, altering the body, how they could get away with it, who did it, and he is led through a maze of interviews in Washington and California, all over the country, with alleged witnesses. Now, Lifton gave all of his information to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and they didn't use it at all, and he concludes his book by saying, this demands another investigation. Well, there was a six a million dollar investigation going on and he was in Washington giving him all this stuff and they must have really been laughing uh, very hard at the way he was pursuing this and not using a single person or a piece of evidence as being factual. I really can only speculate on why Macmillan, a major publisher, would take a book with so many uh, probabilities or perhaps Usually book publishers are very cautious and they don't ask you to buy a book for sixteen ninety five that says so little and has so much confusion in it. I don't know their motive and only one of the things I would guess was that it does leave you confused and it doesn't solve the assassination and that if you're thirsty for a book on the Kennedy assassination and there hasn't been one around for a long time and the national media doesn't get many of the books the attention they deserve, such as Harold Weisberg's books on uh, the Kennedy assassination or Penn Jones' Forgive My Grief, volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4. There are many good books on the assassination. They don't get the attention. And I don't, I don't really know why Macmillan said with Lifton, we'll go ahead with this book and push it and make it a book of the month club and make it a bestseller because I can't, uh, knowing the subject so well, I can't believe that any single person would be able to figure out when the, what they're through when they're through with the book, what happened. And I'm not sure that Macmillan wants you to figure it out. Maybe this general confusion will saturate people who will say, "I'm not going to read another book because I paid sixteen dollars for this and I don't know anything about it." I can only speculate on these things because, as I say, I've known Lifted for fifteen years. I'm really disgusted that he pushed this. I wish him luck with it if what he wants to do is sell it. Uh, read it critically or don't read it at all, but understand that when you're through, you're not going to get much out of it. Well, I don't think I'll do more next week. We'll get back to other events, but that is the book, Best Evidence by David Lifton, and this is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. World Watchers International with noted conspiracy investigator Mae Brussel. This program originates from Carmel, California.